So take these broken Ghidorah wings and learn to handle the... Oh, hey, sorry, I didn't see you there. My name's Justin. You might remember our site, Import Monsters, from when Steven and I used to review SH Monster Arts and Ultra Act figures and cover the news before it was cool. Now it's 10 years later, and I am proud to introduce to you SH Monster Arts, 10 Years of Destruction. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. It's Steven here, and today we sing a birthday song. Today is the day the first SH Monster Arts figure released. And with that, we have to celebrate. The highs of figure releases like Kiyu to the lows of King Ghidorah 2019. We're going to cover it all here. Without further ado. The SH Monster Arts line has been groundbreaking. Whether it be the introduction of Yuji Sakai into the action figure realm, internet groups and forums going up in smoke, or Godzilla being identified as a key franchise for product development for North America, no one can deny the popularity of the line. Starting back in 2011 with a simple teaser expanding later that year with an actual physical release, here we are a decade later with a new Godzilla film to boot reflecting on everything Tamashi Nations and how far the line has come. Hello collectors, it's Steven here, and let it be my pleasure to guide you through SH Monster Arts, 10 years of destruction. 10 years, that's a long time. While most of the history of the line is well preserved in the releases, the quality speaks for each one in and of itself, that's 10 years of interviews, forum posts, ask me anythings on image boards, that 404 in a week, comments from people who no longer work for Bandai, which moving forward, I'm just going to say Bandai, or Bluefin. So if you're looking for a direct source of information on most of this, well, I can provide my sources wherever I can. What I can say is, though, I'm an avid fan of the line and I'll present everything best to my knowledge, even if I don't like it, and as factual as possible. There's no way I can search through a thread on a forum that was deleted because the admins didn't want the information someone was associated with them who was engaging in sketchy behaviors and deleted the thread because, uh, well, they were too big. Yeah, quote unquote. Believe me. I've been here since the beginning of the line, and I know how this all has gone down. I'll source where I can, but no promises on everything. So with that out of the way, let's start where we need to. Who's Tamashi, and why are they a nation? Bandai is split up into different divisions, and each one could be treated as nearly a completely different company. For example, though Bandai may make Gundam action figures and models, the respective teams have different R&D departments and they don't really share information. So Bandai is split up into Bandai and Bandai Spirits, and you can think of the red label as the one being normal Bandai, with product on the shelves at cheaper price points, while blue Bandai, Bandai Spirits, is more for adult collectors, difficult model kits, things you need to spend a pretty coin on. Most folks know of Bandai, the Godzilla realm anyway, as the people who do the movie Monster Series figures. While true, not. Those are made by the boys division, not Tamashi Nations, and furthermore, they're regular Bandai, not Bandai Spirits. Quite a few degrees of separation there. Moral of the story here is that while Bandai is Bandai, Bandai is not Bandai. Now to talk about Bluefin distribution a little bit, or as they're now known as Bluefin Brands. Bluefin essentially operates by having all of the figures released in one specific month shipped at the end of the month, and then the figures are sent to retail partners approximately four to six weeks after they're released in Japan. What this means is, let's say we have figures that are released in the month of November. On the last day of November, all the figures that are released that month will be shipped to Bluefin, and they will arrive to them in sometime in December. Then, once they arrive, they will get shipped out to retail partners. This is a little frustrating for some consumers because they there is an extended wait time and it can be anywhere from four to six weeks after the figure is released in Japan, but this is a good thing because this reflects accurate retail demand in the United States. If you purchase a figure from a Japanese retailer, then that counts as a sale in Japan, not as a sale in the US. And depending on where you order in the US, you may be able to get a much better deal than you would from a Japanese retailer depending on exchange rates. It's, it's unfortunate now that people are, it's sad and I, I met with some customers today <laughs> um, who have come to us with product and they say, well, my package is a little dirty. And we look at where they bought it and they bought it from AmiAmi. And we can't offer them any local customer support because it doesn't have a Bluefin sticker on it. Yeah, yeah. If they would have bought it at Big Bad Toy Store, which started pl placing pre-orders for the product at the exact same time as AmiAmi, 
we would be able to offer that customer service support and they wouldn't have paid that extra money for shipping costs, which paying EMS shipping to import a pillow or import right now with the Japan exchange rate. Oh, it's, the exchange it's rate. It's under, it's, it's under um, 80 yen or, you know, for, for the dollar right now. So yeah, you're, yeah. you're looking at, you know, if you're selling, if you're, if you're paying EMS, like, I don't know, it would be 1500 yen uh, to import. You're looking at over $20. Uh, oh, did, to I, that. I, I, I totally Why feel pay like that? that? Why not just go to a, one of our official online retailers here that's posting for pre order the same time? You will have to wait an additional three weeks to a month, but you'll be able to secure your pre order. You will not have to pay for shipping. You'll be saving a lot of money. And if there is a, an issue with the product, uh, there will be customer service support available for you locally. Well, I think the customer service thing, it's a very important thing to get out. I actually, I, I wasn't aware of that myself. And uh, I think a lot of it also comes from so many of us have the habit ingrained over the last two or three years. Of to go to a Hobby Link or an Ami Ami. Exactly, and, yeah. And it, for some items where we don't have the license here, the customer may not have the choice, but they should look at, uh, I, one, one thing I could recommend is looking at our Facebook site. And, and that Absolutely. really is going to highlight some of the more popular items and, and really focus on what's being solicited. Also, do check, you know, Amazon, Big Bad Toy Store. Um, a lot of, you know, the stores I mentioned here in New York uh, will be taking um, the pre-orders at the same time. But Forbidden Planet, Midtown Comics, and Image Anime, who also has a great online shop as well. Um, they'll all be handling this at the exact same time frame. Oh, okay. So while it may be difficult for some to wait, you also get the product support. Nevertheless, the line does have official release dates hosted on the only official SH Monster Arts related website, and that is going to be tamashi.jp. And as such, that website is going to be the source for all release dates and price tax excluded, because when the line started, I think it was at about 3%, then 5%, 8%, and 10%. Could be wrong on that, but tax has gone up over the years. Tamashi Nations, or some collectors prefer Soul Nations, is the collector's division of Bandai, falling in the Bandai Spirits label. They've made figures since earliest I've been able to see is approximately 2009 or so. Some older lines, perhaps not even initially under the Tamashi Nations label, or their lines, were folded into them since that's where the product line would be today. You can even think of Chogokin or Solo Chogokin, you've heard of those. Some kaiju fans may remember the Chogokin Kiyus, Showa Mechagodzillas, and even the Gigans, which were initially even incorrectly labeled as Soul of Chogokins by the, uh, by the fandom. Those just kind of got folded into Tamashi Nation's figures just by simply the line's names. Believe it or not, they have quite the history in many different collections, and fans the world over enjoy Tamashi Nation's products. Dragon Ball, Gundam, Ultraman, Saint Seiya, Evangelion, Kamen Rider, they've worked on so many properties originating from Japan, and even some from the United States by today's release standards, that if you've been a part of the import game at all, you've probably seen or even purchased something from Tamashi Nation's throughout your collecting journey. The SH Monster Arts line had its genesis in two parts, in name and actualization. Looking at how it came to be is actually pretty interesting and most folks don't really know how it happened because of the language barrier and simply believing, if you will, playground rumors or assuming things like Mew being under the truck or thinking the Nintendo DS stands for dual screen when it stands for developer system. Let's start with the name. SH Monster Arts can be seen as a spin-off or a sister line to a major line of Tamashi Nations called SH Figure Arts. SHF started with Kamen Rider, Dragon Ball, and other miscellaneous properties. But where did superhero figure arts come from? Well, it's not superhero. Just a little bit of a disclaimer, I'm not really the best with pronouncing Japanese, so bear with me here. The Sochaku Henshin series of Kamen Rider figures was a line of figures made from the early to late 2000s that involved an armor gimmick, and wouldn't you know it, Sochaku Henshin translates to armor transformation. So it makes sense. This line was eventually retired and made into SH Figure Arts, which initially utilized die cast parts like the feet and ankles to help with balance and stability. Nowadays, we don't really see that too often, but they've become so amazing that they dominate the market, and they have become a staple in many collections. Oh, and figure arts haven't really found an origin there, but come on, figure arts. Okay, we have a name, even if the armor transformation bit doesn't really fit, but hey, it works. So where did the line originate from? Yuji Sakai. Yuji Sakai is a prolific sculptor and even worked on many of the movies you know, maybe even love. Heisei was a weird era. Anyway, for years, he had been working on model kits and sold them privately at a twice-a-year event in Japan called Wonder Festival. Which, by the way, 
Wonderfest is the abbreviation of it. Wonderfest is an event in Kentucky. Now, I will be interpreting this the best that I can because of language barrier, but in referencing what I can, I believe I'm spot on. I have my sources here for this, so you can look at these for yourself. In February 2011, Yuji Sakai posted on his blog that he was sculpting a Heisei Godzilla for an action figure line that he wanted to make. He would show progress of this figure and mention that Bandai would be in collaboration for this. Further down the line, we would see a promotion of this Godzilla on display. And in the promotional displays, looking at the placards, you'll notice there's not SH Monster Arts. Nope, and it's not hidden in Japanese. It's just omitted entirely. It's just being promoted as a Godzilla action figure line. And not only did we see Godzilla, we saw some other kaiju. At this time, we even saw an elusive prototype, which we haven't seen since basically here. A burning Godzilla, which was a Godzilla 94, but with translucent red and orange plastic. Not like the burning Godzilla figure we actually got, but just straight up using the 94 sculpt. Bandai caught on with these figures, saw the potential in a dream project meant to be possibly a one-off, who knows, became the SH Monster Arts line. Now, some may find the idea of Bandai, say, buying out essentially a garage kit odd since they're a major company and they can sculpt in-house, but put an earmark on this. Hello, Biolante and Batra. So here we are, the groundwork. You know where they come from. Now, where do we go? Well, let's talk about the start of the line with Godzilla 1994. July 2011 was a nice month, nice and warm. I remember it for my own reasons, but it was rounding the final four months before we got the first release. It was this month that we had the first look at the first support for the line. And I'm talking about the major support here, not just a quick look at some prototypes. We saw more confirmation for Godzilla and Mecha Godzilla with protos for Space Godzilla and Mogera. Yay! Here we see the debut of the first effect set and the Garuda set. We saw a nice diorama here, actually with an old prototype of Space Godzilla. So we get two prototypes of the same figure. Hmm, it won't be the first time that this happens. Coming up in a few days later from this event, we had SDCC 2011, which is probably one of the most memorable Godzilla displays. Godzilla coming out of the water, a real life location, this is pretty neat. For yours truly, it really helped to inspire appreciation for displays. It was a real neat summer. Now, eagle-eyed viewers will note that Yuji Sakai not only drew an interesting choice of Godzilla there, but hmm, I wonder what the first Showa SH Monster Arts figure might be. Hmm. At any rate, these events showcased something cool. They went ahead and did some stop motion videos, and one portion I'll show you here. Not the whole thing because of copyright. This isn't intended to be everything here, just a recap of the last 10 years. You can still actually find these up around the web, and I encourage you to check these out. You're going to have to do a little bit of digging, but if you know what to look for, you'll be able to find them, no problem. Now. Godzilla and Mecha Godzilla. The first two figures in the line, they were solicited over the summer. Godzilla was priced at 5,500 Japanese yen or in USD at the time because of the exchange rate, 67.99. Based on the 1994 design of Godzilla, he sports a nice bone white dorsal plate configuration, great articulation and need of all a beam effect. Oh yeah, very cool. And alongside this one, we now have Mecha Godzilla from the Heisei era, 6,500 JPY. This figure came with parts to recreate the flying mode, plasma grenade, belly button support, and the Mega Buster beam effect. Both beam effects were only for the first production runs of the figure, which there would only be one reissue of the 1994 Godzilla and no reissue of Mecha Godzilla. Now you may be saying there's a Super Mecha Godzilla that comes later. That's different. Now of note, Godzilla is going to come out in November, hence 10 years, and Mecha Godzilla will be in December. So some months go by. Yes, there was presence at New York Comic Con, but apparently they brought back the old dioramas in a new one. Ooh, we'll save that for the next part. It looks cooler there. And all this time, we were waiting. 
During this time, a lot of collectors were just beginning to learn about Tamashi Nations, and we really didn't know that they showed off the final product right before release at this time. And pictures of the displays, even at NYCC, never really got us prepared for the next month. This would also be the first NYCC where we would see interviews pop up about the line, direct discussions, or just behind the scenes information. For nowhere else on the open market, they are not offered in Japan. Yeah. So the only way you could shop for a normal price retail at a retail store is via the US market and it's only coming from Bluefin. So Dragon Ball SH Figure Arts has basically been made for the US fans. And all the releases that we have when we decide who's coming out next, is basically determined on feedback from our U.S. fan base. That's awesome. Um, I mean, it's just a lot of this stuff is uh, like the Dragon Ball thing, or, or uh, even the fact that you've, you've, you know, on your Facebook, you mentioned just a poll of would you like to eventually see web yeah. exclusives. Just the fact that that's happening is to me very amazing. Because I got into figure arts when it launched. I was in Japan for the launch somehow, and uh, so I've been with it since the, since the beginning. And I've seen it become this highly sought after line. So uh, to see this much support, you know, on this end of the coast has been uh, fantastic for a lot of fans. Well, figure arts, um, uh, D arts, and uh, now even uh, SH Monster Arts uh, with Godzilla items. Uh, these this sort of action figure category hasn't really been around. I mean, Revel Tech was kind of following along with the pricing down area, taking out accessories to make a certain price point. We're going the opposite way. We're adding accessories. We're experimenting with composite materials. Uh, we're adding die cast to even some of the figure arts. Uh, another success we've had with SH Figure Arts now is actually Tiger and Bunny, and that's oh, yes. a focus in this event in particular. Uh so we were hyped. <laughs> Happy birthday, Godzilla. Your first real action figure is here. Oh, oh my. Wow. <clears throat> Honey. Yeah, the big issue that we had here was the eye decals on many of the units were not aligned properly. Additionally, many fans were not wowed by the articulation for the price. Facebook groups and forum responses were relatively chilly, let's say. Though Monster Master Yuji Sakai did indeed sculpt this and many others in the line, some fans were not feeling it. Now, Mecha Godzilla was fine, but the thing is, there wasn't much to begin with here. So Mecha Godzilla just came out a little bit after Godzilla did, and these two releases, of course, were brought over by Bluefin, then distribution. Though the third release, an accessory set with the tanks and the beams, which came out in December alongside Mecha Godzilla, which was a premium Bandai release, did not. And we'll talk about premium Bandai in just a little bit. So Bandai has a questionable start to the line. Two figures released, one accessory set, and a third, remember this guy, Space Godzilla confirmed to be early next year. Not that promising. What can they do to turn this around? This. Every year, Tamashi Nations holds an event titled Tamashi Nation. Take the plural off of nations, where they debut prototypes. Sometimes they will end up being released, sometimes not. And here they showed off what is referenced as a decade later as the best SH Monster Arts display and an event ever. Prominently displayed, we have Fire Rodan, the Destroyer Aggregate, and King Ghidorah. Little Godzilla was also on display, gotta love the little dude, though he was not with the new Godzilla-related kaiju revealed. He was with uh, Space Godzilla and Mogera. Regardless, the initial ho-hum reception of the first two, technically three releases, was discarded by the night's newest sensation, and this diorama captured everyone's attention. Space Godzilla and Mogera were on display as well. The diorama had some fun buildings and water effects, and not gonna lie, Bandai needs to bring these out on the market. Yes, we would get buildings later, but not like this. Now, I didn't touch on one thing just yet, this being what fans will know as the first SH Monster Arts to be stuck in prototype hell. Note, I talked about the Godzilla-related releases. The SH Monster Arts with Tsuno Kusagami was displayed here and only ever here never to be seen again. This display would give us a great look into what 2012 would have, both known and unknown. We got teased of a burning sensation in our first real quality control disaster.
before we begin talking about the SH Monster Arts line some more, we need to go back and talk about the SH Figure Arts line for a little bit. Remember I talked about Premium Bandai? That's going to come into play here. Kind of funny how we sometimes have to go back to talking about other lines before we can really talk about our favorite line here, isn't it? At the end of 2011, there was a release of the SH Figure Arts Super Saiyan 3 Goku. This release only came to be because of fan demand in North America. Essentially, Tamashii Nations, Bandai, they are interchangeable like I said earlier, was pretty much done with the Dragon Ball SH Figure Arts releases. However, because of the demand in North America, specifically the United States, Bluefin was able to talk to Tamashii Nations and encourage them to continue releases in the Dragon Ball lineup with those continued properties. So they were able to get a release of the Super Saiyan Vegeta, which was stuck in prototype hell as well. These releases were set to essentially never come out, but thanks to Bluefin putting the word into the ear of Tamashii Nations here, they were able to be released. How much influence does the uh, the U.S. Tokusatsu fans have in the future of, uh, with Tamashii? Uh, a lot. You know, I, I'd say like two or three years ago, not much, but right now we're Bluefin is another thing they're involved in is we, we look at the US, we take polls on Facebook, we have a survey going on here on an iPad for the first time. We're looking at questions and we're actively developing product for the US market and you brought up a really good example. Dragon Ball, if it weren't for the US market, we wouldn't be making any figure arts Dragon Ball right now. None whatsoever, zip. Because uh, the trend in Japan is really, really cold right now. But it's super hot here. So an, our entire Dragon Ball marketing right now is basically U.S. centric, and I think it's going to grow out. We have other agents in other markets, Europe as well, and that's very popular in Latin America. But um, yeah, it's basically based here. And in Japan, the market is so small that it's only an exclusive. So the only way you can get it on the open market up to now for some of these recent releases like Trunks, the Comic Con exclusives, Gohan. Upcoming, we have Cell, which is uh, perfect form, which is right. the high hopes for that one. The only way you get it on, on an open market is via Bluefin, so um, Bluefin's become a kind of one-stop shop for that one uh, with distribution. Uh, and you mentioned Tokusatsu. Right. Uh, talking about live action. Well, if I could jump to the, actually the kaiju aspect as well. Uh, a lot of the stuff we're doing right now with uh, Godzilla basically is focusing on Bluefin. So, Burning Godzilla well, over there around that wall. We'll see you later. Uh, but also, at San Diego Comic Con, we had a an exclusive out there called Comic Con Explosion. So we're making. Godzilla and Kaiju product now for the US and for Tokusatsu, very timely. Um, those two products, I, or two lines I just mentioned, those are two strategic products that we're basing off of US demand. So R&D is focused on US demand. And we're adding another one into the fold starting from 2013, or actually starting today uh, because we have some pre-sales of a Megazord. And that's uh, Power Rangers because the uh, 20th anniversary is coming next year. So we're basing a lot of the R&D on that next year, uh, basically based on US demand only. Now, these were released as premium Bandai exclusives, most commonly known on the internet as web exclusives. Now, something to keep in mind here at this time, Bluefin was its own company. They were not a part of Tamashi Nations, not owned by Bandai whatsoever. They were only business partners who were able to put feedback on the table for Bandai and let them know what the demographic wanted in their territory. Now, do note, as talked about previously in the last part, web exclusives, which are interchangeable with premium Bandai or P Bandai, were not brought over to the United States, so the US would miss out on the first accessory set, which again would be released in December of 2011 at a retail price of 24.15 Japanese yen, and the Garuda set, which would come out in March for about 26.25 Japanese yen, and that's going to be March of 2012. However, once there was a deal that was worked out for web exclusives, then this was all taken care of and allow for web exclusives to be brought over to the United States without any issues. And it did cause a little bit of confusion at first, but eventually the web exclusives would be able to be brought over to the US for general retail release and store shelves. So if they carried Tamashi Nation's product, then they were able to stock any of the web exclusives with no issues. To the Tamashi web grind, which I believe Two years ago, we talked about being uh, tricky to deal with on this end. Yeah, I mean, we're offering a lot of a lot of the Tamashi Nations product line is actually going Tamashi Web exclusive, and we're getting more and more access to that stuff in the U.S. So, D Arts aligned with the uh, Black Zero for uh, Mega Man, yeah. that's also available here. A lot of the Monster Art stuff right now, um, like the Destroyer Evolution set, um, 
Batra. Uh, that stuff were, is, because strategically for the U.S. is such an important line, that we're actually focusing on the U.S. market and just leaving them exclusives over here. There, it, 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 it really, it's the U.S. market that's driving a lot of those lines, especially DR's Mega Man as well. And we've seen quite a large swell in the, uh, our retailer interest in carrying these properties, especially the Godzilla. And uh, with uh, the new SH Monster Arts, Alien and Predator, we're getting a lot more um, retailers outside of our normal anime, Japanese uh, retailers that are becoming interested in them. So uh, from our perspective as a distributor for pushing out Tamashii Nation's product into the U.S., like we're starting to get a larger variety of stores as well. Okay, enough of that. Let's get back to the kaiju. First and foremost, again, aside from the web exclusives that we missed out on, first and foremost, in March, we have the final release of Space Godzilla for 6,500 Japanese yen. This one took a little bit of time to get released, and as we all know, we were all hyped about this one to finally come out. And here it is, and something of note, yes, Space Godzilla does come with an effect part and a crystal base. Now, this is something that fans were really happy about because it is a beam effect. Now, admittedly, some say that he's puking up some orange juice, but we still get a beam, and it's relatively accurate to the source material. Now, upon release of Space Godzilla, however, the paint application uh, was kind of changed from the prototype. Instead of an accurate, more so blue paint scheme, it was changed to a somewhat purple and a dark red paint scheme. This is a little bit of a departure, but the odd thing here is, is that didn't, it didn't really affect people's opinions of the figure. So many years later, this figure is still at the tops of the chart for favorite figures in the line. The articulation is absolutely a step up from the previous releases, Godzilla and Mechagodzilla, and this figure is essentially going to come with all that it needs. We'll see in a little bit that there are other accessories available for this figure, but still, it's pretty much a complete package. Oh, and by the way, the eyes were fine. Now, I do want to jump ahead a little bit and cover premium Bandai releases now. So let's move to June for 3300 Japanese yen, the Little Godzilla and Crystal set. This set was, I made mention before, a web exclusive only available through the P Bandai web shop. This is where some confusion came into play. Little Godzilla here came alongside some crystals for Space Godzilla to use as his own baby jail. There's another word that I like to use here, shoutouts to Simple Flips, but let's keep it PG, shall we? The crystals, while not necessarily accurate to the source material, are very nice to have, and Bandai should have done more. Now, in regards to web exclusives at this time, Bluefin was able to bring them over as general retail releases at any of your preferred retailers. The problem here, though, is that some folks in the community who are known as dealers, and people who show up to conventions to sell figures, they had experience ordering rare, limited items from different web shops and stores in Japan. These folks did promote Little Godzilla and upcoming web exclusives as being only available through Japanese resources. As a matter of fact, they also promoted some of the previously released figures as being only able to be imported from Japan. No mention of Bluefin. Yeah. At any rate, folks who knew where to purchase through general retail as usual, no issue. But some folks unfortunately paid way more than they should have for some of these releases, especially the web exclusives, because they went ahead and ordered through a middleman service. Or they went through dealers who probably charged them a bit too much. That being said, some folks just wanted to simply get them early. This is a good segue into another portion that I wanted to talk about, which let's get to Mogera right now. As the next general release, we're jumping back to May for 6,500 Japanese yen. And this one actually brought a few questions. At the time, Tamashii Nations was still dabbling around with a few different releases, and they had a few different gimmicks that they could execute under their belt. Possibly, and we wouldn't actually see this one in a different line until much later. One of the big questions that folks had, was this figure going to be able to transform into different vehicles? No. No, it was not. And to this day, they have not done separate releases for the different vehicles that Mogera is supposed to split into, which I'm surprised that they haven't considering a lot of the Heisei releases in the SH Monster Arts line. At any rate, Mogera came packed with accessories, which includes missiles, beam effects, special display bases with buildings. Yeah, yeah. Continuing on with releases for the first half of the year, we have one more, which was absolutely a fan favorite and is still talked about to this day as one that is super duper highly appreciated. This would be the SH Monster Arts Fire Rodan in July for 3,500 Japanese yen. 
Fire Rodan comes packed with accessories, not only for himself, but for his friends too in this release. We get the Red Spiral Ray to use with Godzilla, as he used in the movie after he got powered up, and we also get an alternate headpiece for the previously released SH Monster Arts Mechagodzilla from the Heisei era. This damaged eye is to reflect when Rodan pecked out Mechagodzilla's eye. Rodan also comes with an array of support stands, so this way you can display Rodan flying, or you can have him hovering over the ground. Unfortunately, we really won't see a release similar to this again in the line. All right, we have our releases for the first half of 2012. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. All right, as you may be aware, we do have some events that happen throughout the year for Tamashi Nations. This is where we're able to see some new releases, some updated prototypes, and generally speaking, just have ourselves a good time online getting to see all of the new figures we'll get to throw our money at and sometimes get duds. Hint, hint. This is where we're going to see Tamashi features come to life. This one going to be volume three. In regards to the SH Monster Arts line, we saw prototypes for Space Godzilla, again, Fire Rodan, and Mogera and King Ghidorah. We already know what those figures are, and we've already had the solicitations for pretty much all of them. We have release dates and prices, so this is just a little bit more of the same. At the same time, we did get to see the final production piece for Space Godzilla here at this point, so that was very nice to see. Something to take note of, as mentioned before, whenever we have an event or a display very close to a release date of the figure, generally speaking, that's going to be a display of the production piece. During this event, we also got treated to a new entry into the SH Monster Arts line. So far, we've only been able to see figures from the Godzilla property and one that we pretty much don't talk about anymore. Now, we have angels from Rebuild of Evangelion. We have two angels here on the screen and oh boy, people were excited to see these figures here. And admittedly, they were only prototypes and we did have some accessories shown with them, but these were prototypes people were super happy about. That means we're going to get to see them again, right? Oh boy, we will. We did get to see them alongside the Beast Mode for Ava Unit 2. Nothing else, unfortunately. But this was a fantastic display presence of what we could potentially get released in the future. But I did say we'll see them again, so that's good. A little over the halfway mark of the year is San Diego Comic-Con. SDCC 2012 brought along with it, unfortunately not a whole lot, but we did get some displays for the upcoming SH Monster Arts figures along with some of the ones that at this time were either already released or were soon to be released. Now what was very cool about this event though, I said it didn't bring a whole lot with it and that's because at the time it really didn't. At SDCC 2012, we got something in the SH Monster Arts line, an event exclusive, that we wouldn't see the likes of again until 2020. This would be the Comic-Con Explosion Godzilla. Now, those who know their Bandai vinyl figures well know that there is a version of the 1995 mold referred to as Meltdown Godzilla. This is a reference to that release. This is, however, using the 1994 mold of Godzilla in the SH Monster Arts line. So it's not a direct one-for-one -one like the Bandai vinyl, but it is a fantastic throwback. Of note, there was a fantastic piece of artwork made for the box, referencing Godzilla melting down and destroying San Diego Comic-Con. Do take note that Meltdown may not have been the best use of a word and was not associated with this release whatsoever due to recent events in Japan. What were those? Something about a nuclear reactor? Could be the case. Summer 2012, Japan. You can do the research. Also, this would be the only SH Monster Arts figure exclusive to the United States of America for official distribution. This figure was not available to Japan officially, nor was it available in other territories. You can also see here it had an MSRP of $55. Following this release, it was available on Amazon and other select retailers at wholesale. Because apparently it didn't sell too well at the con. And then it bottomed out once it hit retailers. And then years later, it skyrocketed in price to show you don't sleep on stuff when it's affordable. That's going to be the moral of the story with this line in the years to come. As we exit the summer convention season and head into the fall with the last of 2012's releases, we have another event at the start of September. Another Tamashi Features, Volume 4. While we didn't inherently get anything here for the SH Monster Arts line, they did unveil more releases, this time for the 12-inch Perfect Model, or 12PM for short. And Tamashi Nations unveiled their first Godzilla 1989. 
This would be the first of now four 89 Godzilla releases they have promoted. Or technically three, you'll see coming up soon. Unfortunately, this figure is still on ice, and we haven't seen this get a release yet. Maybe if you're interested, hit Bandai up, yeah? Shortly after this, we hit King Ghidorah's release date. September, and he retailed at 9,800 Japanese yen. Here are the promo picks, and he looks wonderful. We have beam effects, which are executed rather poorly, and a huge figure, and another of Toho's big five hitting the lineup. What could go wrong? Well, right after this, we got another huge reveal. The SH Monster Arts Desotoroya, the biggest figure in the line so far with the biggest price tag. Of note, this is not actually where Shinichi Wakasa enters into the ring as a sculptor. He did sculpt Little Godzilla, but this is going to be one of the releases that he's really well known for. Throughout the rest of the video, I may reference on back to him, but do note, Yuji Sakai is not the only sculptor for this line. There are going to be others. US fans were looking at about 130 bucks in a big box. Did I mention at this point Burning Godzilla and Godzilla Jr. were also revealed? Yeah, that's right, we'll take a look at them in a minute. So here's September for the English speaking world of SH Monster Arts collectors. We have our first look at a Biogoji sculpt, not Monster Arts, but hey, we got one. Confirmation of a mostly complete Godzilla vs. Destroy a lineup all at once. Remember, we got the aggregate as well. What could possibly go wrong? A faulty wing system. Ghidorah's a bust. We in the US basically couldn't catch up to anything due to a language barrier, at least most of us who are not in the know. We didn't hear about any sorts of issues, but the SH Monster Arts King Ghidorah had an issue with the wings breaking. It wasn't an isolated issue, only a couple of people had it. It seemed like every week for months there were reports of breaking wings, with one user even reporting that his wings broke off in the middle of the night. Not good. It went even so far as that Bandai went up and put up a page on how to handle his wings to prevent issues with breakages. Though it has since been pulled down and now this is the only thing that exists on the Wayback Machine. It's also led to a few weird ideas and comments like people saying North America got a bad batch or there was a secret fix and you know it because it's packaged differently and some even trying to justify it by saying for some reason when it was shipped by EMS to North America that jostled it and broke it. No, that's not the case. All Ghidorahs are made at the same time regardless of where you get them. I even have a video on regional differences. So what's the issue here? What caused this? The general consensus seems to be too tight of a thin joint positioned at an awkward angle, begging for a break. Basically, if it just so happens to be moved the wrong way, you're going to snap it. It's an engineering flaw. Anyway. Right after getting us hyped up with this mess, <sighs> what next? Bandai continues on, and they brought the heat to NYCC 2012. This year was huge because they got the rights to the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. And this was the big reveal for NYCC that year. Yeah, that was it. So SH Monster Arts collectors, you can go home. But wait a minute. GO BACK! I WANT TO BE MONKEY! That's right! The first non-Godzilla kaiju in the lineup, Kong, is revealed at New York Comic Con. Now I say that because Kong does get released. We have Destroya on display as well as Burning Godzilla and Junior, but Kong! Monkey! Now, this was admittedly not everyone's favorite design of the character, but it was a breath of fresh air in the lineup to venture outside of Godzilla and get a confirmed release. Now, at the time, it apparently was not confirmed they had to go through licensing, but yes, we get Kong, and even in two different poses here. I actually changed it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, um... Well, that's, that's kind of all. Yeah. All right. So we're skipping ahead a bit, and then we're circling back for a bit. Got a little too hyped with some uh, with some big releases. I didn't really talk about Burning Godzilla. The proper name here being Godzilla 1995 and Godzilla Jr. Burning Godzilla is out on the market at the end of November for 6,800 Japanese yen, and it ended up being the 2.0 Heisei Godzilla we, like it or not, needed. One more year of development and there were a lot of changes to not only make it more so suit accurate, but to also change up the engineering. 
They utilize translucent plastic and this release is screen accurate with frosty white dorsal plates where appropriate. Fun fact, in some select groups there were some fans complaining the plates were white, saying they should be perspective accurate and they should be orange. Hmm. Well, we'll get that released later. The first production run of Burning Godzilla comes with two exclusive Mazer tanks not to be found in reissues. However, the figure has not been reissued. Godzilla Jr. released in December of that year a P. Bandai release for 4,000 Japanese yen coming with two helicopters. Burning Godzilla was roughly $85 at the time of the exchange rate and Jr. was 50. They were shown off at Wonder Festival Summer 2012 as well, which Bandai figures were not normally shown at. I wonder what the following winter may bring us. Now, though these two may have closed out the year, there was still something else that happened right before the end. Something bigger. Tamashii Nation 2012 at the end of October that year. From Macross, Macross, yeah, Vadra. Probably pronouncing that incorrectly, but my apologies, fans. <sighs> but once again, stuck in prototype hell, and after this reveal, never to be seen again. Yeah. Much like more angels from Evangelion. Like I said, we would see the angels again. They reveal more of them to never be released. Sadly, that is life. Something I've been saving up until this point. Yeah. Now, during the summer, after Bluefin clearly communicated that fan demand helps to influence product, a lot of people in the community posted to Bluefin's Facebook page, tweeted to them, posted on forums. We want SH Monster Arts by Olante. Some say, would never have happened, but we got it. The prototype was revealed. When the first picture was leaked online, I remember it fondly because it was five in the morning, my time, I stayed up to get confirmation after rumors were going around and she was there. Note, there's a Godzilla 1989 present and that's not the 12 p.m. And it's not the Kokyo Kyok and not the 89 that ended up being released so many years later. Above this display was a nice loadout of already released or soon to be released figures in the lineup. There were some shenanigans from people that Biollante wouldn't get released because of the size of the box, it would cost too much. Well, a year later it would happen. Now the response here to Biollante was lukewarm, too skinny, proportions not correct, very much so mixed. Now it was sculpted by the person who brought Biollante to life, but it's not the only time that he sculpted Biollante. Anyway, enough of 2012. We'll talk more of Biollante next year. And 2012 is over. Whew, talk about a tumultuous year. Was it good? Bad? Dunno, but it had a lot going on, and 2013 is gonna be interesting. Like a cookie, cream-filled cookie, with a cookie, cream, then cookie, but the cream is missing in the middle. What? Yeah, we have a lot, nada, then a lot. In February, we get the release of Desu Toroya for 12,000 yen. Shipping was astronomical if purchased from Japan, so a good number of collectors opted for the US distribution, which came a little bit later. And that's gonna contribute to a portion of why the middle of the year was a little bland. In February of this year, seemingly back to back, we had Toy Fair and then Wonder Festival Winter 2013. Again, not Wonderfest, that's a sci-fi convention in Kentucky. Anyway, at Toy Fair, we were promised a new reveal. We got Squat. NECA actually kicked off their Pacific Rim licensing, but nothing. Now, what about One Fest? That's the proper shorter way to say it. One Fest, as we sort of talked about a little bit earlier, is essentially a hobby convention where smaller companies, not Bandai, and hobbyists come to display their upcoming products and offer their items for sale as well. Those in the kaiju realm, you can think of some garage kit makers, and you can think of, like, let's say, X+. Plus. Those in the larger import game, Good Smile Company. This year, though, Bandai actually began to dip their toe in the water sort of, with stuff like Sailor Moon. But they didn't bring anything Godzilla. No, but Yuji Sakai is the main sculptor of the line and he's in regular attendance. 
Y'all remember a couple years back when we had this display with the original SH Monster Arts figures? Remember how I noted that there was a particular Showa suit that was present, but not quite? Well, at this one fest, a display prototype of Godzilla, 1964. This was met with criticism and praise. Praise because now, not only do we have Kong who's going to be released this year, who we'll get to in a minute, we had a prototype of the Evangelion Angels, which... Rest in peace. And now, Showa in the line? Awesome. Criticism because of the hip... <clears throat> triangles? And another reason that you know, we were kind of told about ahead of time, but we didn't really know about until it was released, that's going to be the sizing. Here's where we get into an interesting pseudo dry spell in the year. Kong, the eighth wonder of the world, gets released in April for 5,500 JPY. At the time, he was met with praise, mostly though, because, well, in retrospect, there were some issues. But hey, Monkey, Monkey was good because he was new. Yes. Now, uh, later on, we see that maybe the engineering wasn't all that great, and as time has gone on, apparently there have been some issues with biceps liking to shear off. Now of note, there is an infamous prototype picture of him holding his little girlfriend. That picture was initially not supposed to be sent out for solicitation, but for right here, I, of course, am going to have it for you. Following this, the P. Bandai exclusive Destroya Evolution set, which was a first. We got our first flying form Destroya figure without a flight stand. Why? The set was released in June for 8,000 Japanese yen. During this time frame, we do see Biolante on display at the Akiba showroom with a prototype of Godzilla 1989, which was shown back with her reveal. Or was it? Regardless, we'll zoom ahead to 2020 soon enough and we'll get our answer. As a side note, throughout the duration of the 10 years the Monster Arts line has been around, the Akiba showroom is known for having displays for different Tamashii Nations figures. Just something to go ahead and spend your free time looking up. At this time, though, I want to address something. Bandai typically announced product in these years roughly five to six months ahead of release. And if you'll notice, the releases are spaced a few months apart. So we'll have some months where there's nothing, then suddenly a deluge of info. This didn't make some in the community happy, heralding the death bells for the line, though some folks weren't buying the figures anyway. And then we get Biolante confirmed for release, so you never really could make anyone happy during this year. July was a big month for the lineup. Biolante orders, as you just saw, pre-orders, came up at the end of June, so people could start buying her through orders at the P. Bandai web shop, which is cool. Godzilla 1964 is released, but the U.S. won't be seeing him for quite a few months, and we'll get there soon. Initial response saw it being small, and with the initial Showa release, it's a flop, you might say. Godzilla 64 released for 5,800 Japanese yen in July. The figure received praise for being a figure of a popular incarnation of Godzilla, but the issue here is the engineering saw what were called triangle hip articulation, which turned some folks off in the size. Remember these pictures here? Some folks found them to be rather imposing of the 64 Godzilla, but the final product did not scale up that well. When Godzilla fans refer to scale, there's relative scale and actual scale. Actual being if there's a 6 inch 100 meter Godzilla, then the 50 meter one should be 3 inches. However, relative scale means all of the Godzillas are going to be at the same height when you stack them up shoulder to shoulder. This, which was allegedly justified to be in the actual scale, it failed regardless. Now with this release, we wouldn't see Showa again for a while. In July is SDCC as well. We got teases for Alien vs. Predator, and we saw AVP, Warrior, and Predator Scar. These were teased to be coming in 2014, and we really didn't have much information further for a few months. This would be big, because we have another franchise in the SH Monster Arts line, and at this time, Bandai was hyping it up because they suggested they had licensing rights for everything at a time when NECA said that uh, Ripley wasn't possible. Actually, the alien would be released next year. 
at the same time a Yuji Sakai figure would be released as well. And speaking of that, right after SDCC, much like earlier in the year with Godzilla 1964, Yuji Sakai revealed an SH Monster Arts or two, who's counting, at one fest summer, behold, Mothra and Godzilla 2000 Millennium. Wow! Batra at this time was already solicited for release in January 2014, right before the event happened. So that's why Wally's important, not necessarily as much. Godzilla here, however, was groundbreaking for three reasons, or kinda 2.5. First Millennium figure, first figure based on a concept and or promotional work and not a movie. And he can move his pingors, but we'll lose that articulation when we see him solicited the following month. Then Mothra. Batra was just announced, so this is fitting. Mm, Mothra's cool. Remember last year when, when, when the bad came, immediately followed by the good? Yeah, that's what we have here. Three reveals back to back for Godzilla, a new property, and then Godzilla 64. Did I mention we have Kiyu? That's right, in September for 9,800 yen, we have the Millennium Mecha Godzilla. All the bells and whistles, plenty of accessories priced, to the price is going up. Yes, diecast, but here, here we have prices that are beginning to increase, it seems. Upon release, Kiyu was mostly well received by the community, and actually, over time, popularity increased as well as the reception of the figure. And I'll be talking about the Multi Purpose Fighting System 3 again in the future a few times. Now we're going to talk about NYCC 2013, which was rather quiet with Bandai bringing AVP back with them. But instead of Scar, we get Wolf, fan favorite, cool. They brought the promotional material too. What's fun is that he and the Alien Warrior were confirmed at this time for release in early 2014. And in the time leading up, there were plenty of arguments and civil discussion, of course, never heated, about NECA versus SH Monster Arts here. And who would do it better? Quite frankly, we'll revisit this later. But what did Bluefin and Tamashi Nations have to say? I mean, next year, 2014, is going to be... Anniversary? 35th anniversary of Aliens, so you can expect Big Chap, maybe, and, and, and all the other guys. Sigourney Weaver? I was going to ask you guys, you know, something with the power loader, maybe? Power loader? Maybe, maybe, maybe. maybe. Well, would that be like an Armors Girls project? Maybe, maybe. Maybe, maybe. Girls maybe project. a hypothetical, maybe, hypothetical, hypothetical, maybe, hypothetical maybe, power, loader? power loader? Yes. AGP times Chogoki. Chogoki, yeah. Yes. That'd be hypothetically, that'd be cool. Yeah, I, I, I love I love the cross. The cross yeah, makes yeah, it all worth yeah. it. Oh yes, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, this yeah. Would be a perfect time to show like you know slides of Sigourney Weaver. Yeah, just pictures of yeah, powers yeah, power, power loader. Yeah. You know, imagine if this was a show. You know, this would this be cool. Yeah, yeah. and then, and then juxtapose that with some of our Armor Girls Project Infinite Stratus stuff. Yeah, well, we'll have them hey, split screen. Imagine. We'll have them chroma key yeah, over top of each other. Maybe dance. That'd be awesome. Oh yes, oh yes. All right, show tunes. I know wrong side. Now, what was I talking about earlier about delays in the US? Well, starting in August of 2013 and ending sometime in October of the same year, there was a port strike which stopped the distribution of a lot of things, and in particular here, Bluefin Supply. So when we have a couple of figures every so many months, which is fine, and this port strike, which editors note, workers rights, they need to be taken seriously, we get this cluster, <clears throat> which, yeah, I can see why some people who thought the line would fail would say that it's done and over with, especially when the US market doesn't really get their figures. However, this isn't the case. After this happened, we're good to go, and it, it was just release after release here in the States. Distribution continued, and G64 and Kiyu hit the market with no issues, and fans would be happy. Early November comes and we have Tamashi Nation 2013. Millennium continues. Gaigan 2004, but it's not accurate. Oddly enough, we'll talk about who worked on this one later, and he actually did work on the Destroy Evolution set a bit as well. Let's remember the initial reveal and move on to the thick green girl. End of November, 2013. 22,000 Japanese yen. The SH Monster Arts Biolante is here a year later, 
a P. Bandai exclusive, after campaigning for her release. A little small, but she has a light up feature, and she is by far one of the releases that folks have been looking forward to. Initially, some were turned off because of the price, and she did dip, and then, well, someone paid $700 at a particular convention in 2019 for her, so to say she's not in demand is a bit of an understatement. Now, the next part isn't fact, it's something to keep in mind. Fans of Persona will recognize that we have here Thanatos. Probably pronouncing that incorrectly, but it, you know what I'm talking about. And there's a D-Arts release of it. Back in 2010 or so, there was a garage kit, a resin kit, that was displayed at one fest that had a very limited release. You see these two kind of side by side? It's been widely speculated that Bandai was able to work with the sculptor to use that kit for the D-Arts. Fuyuki Shinada sculpted by Olante, but think of the time frame. Usual production is well known, and when you talk about different releases from different companies, from nothing to prototype can be 8 to 12 months, solicitations need to go up. The line started in 2010 as Sakai's personal project. You have the sculpt, we can estimate that, realized in 2011. Bandai promoted that they would explore bigger and better figures. Now, Shinada could have worked on it really quick to get it done. Or there's a vinyl kit, reissued by M1, but Kyoto made. And here it is. In the next few pictures, there are the instructions. I've disassembled the head of Biolante, and quite frankly, it looks one-to-one -to, -one to me. Now, I'm not saying that they retooled any model kit here, or they used a different sculpt, which I've been told Shinada did sculpt this model kit. But when we get to Batra, you'll see that there's another similar instance. This would account for the arguable accuracy and scale issues that Biolante brought with her. Go ahead and draw your own conclusions. I'm just presenting you the information. December, we get the first sell out almost instantly of the SH Monster Arts line, Godzilla 2000 Millennium. Upon release, this figure was sold out at retail in both Japan and in the United States. It was pre-sold out in the US and MSRP was 7,200 Japanese yen. For some time, it was regarded as one of the best Godzillas in the line, and until a repaint came out later, the aftermarket in the US soared up to nearly $200 in the short time after release. They did remove the finger articulation, but otherwise, what a figure. With new engineering, it hasn't necessarily aged too well since then, but it was a welcome release in the lineup with a rather favorable review for yours truly and several other reviewers. Now, 2013 ends here, and we hit the ground running next month with the SH Monster Arts Batra and Alien Warrior, or is that? Bandai's product shown here. I'm going to stop saying X year was interesting or was this, that, or the other, really, because up until mm, about now, they have been. Whether infamy for quality control issues or having been releases some thought would never be possible, the SH Monster Arts line was delivering the goods so far, pretty much of all the eras, Showa, Heisei, Millennium, and we even have Kong. 2014 would start off with a new franchise, Alien vs. Predator. Here we have the Alien Warrior for 5,500 Japanese yen, released in January. Lukewarm response using die cast parts in <clears throat> strategic areas of the body, causing the tail to be a bit floppy. Otherwise, the figure was rather nice. In the general SH Monster Arts realm, however, it was completely overshadowed by the Batra Imago, which was a web exclusive released the same month, like I said, for 6,000 Japanese yen. Batra came with a dedicated stand and support cradle, which were fiddly if used completely incorrectly. Later in 2014, we would see something questionable, and this was the first sign of it. Batra's wings were played with a quality control issue as seen here still from my review, where the application of the detail, the dot matrix, the decal, is spotted and incomplete in areas. It's very disappointing to fans, and well, it unfortunately isn't going to stop here, so get ready. We'll skip ahead to June real quick and talk about briefly the larvae set for Batra and Mothra, so I can talk about this one thing. Biolante we just talked about in the Kyoto kit? 
Batra Imago and Larva also have Kyoto kits, which look near one to one for each other, both the SH Monster Arts and the model kit, both at approximately the same scale, one 400 scale, from what the actual size of the monster should be. Not saying they repurpose the kits, but if it looks like a duck and it smells like a duck, it's probably not a goose. For the kits, credit to Kaiju Kits for those pictures. Jump back, February, we're on a hot streak, enjoy it. While at last, we have Predator Wolf, 5,500 Japanese yen. And while the articulation ended up being pretty stellar from what everyone has heard with nice accessories, the paint application was not that great. We will be seeing Wolf again in just a little bit. Rumored to be sculpted by Taichi Yamada, who did the flying aggregate apparently as well, Gaigan 2004 releases in April for 9,800 Japanese yen. Gaigan comes with a pair of a, a lot of parts to be swapped between his usual upgraded parts for his chainsaw appearance and his normal, just scythe appearance. So the figure really isn't screen accurate and some fans were mixed, not liking some of the qualities of the figure. Some saying he has chiclet teeth. It unfortunately bottomed out to be about $60 shipped from some import sites. Yes, shipped at the time with not all that fantastic exchange rates, uh, EMS from Japan, though, it eventually hit highs as as much as $600, of course, before the new repaint version was announced. No beams or slash effects, though a stand for some flight poses, that would be a legitimate criticism of the figure. April, Mothra Imago, 6,000 Japanese yen. Like Batra, she only came with a support stand. She was good for the most part, but there were some consistent issues with loose wings. Mine included. Not much to say aside from a P-Bandai exclusive. No beam either, which is unfortunately going to be the common trend moving forward. In May, we got Big Chap for 5,500 Japanese yen. The figure boasted accuracy and truly does have a great sculpt. However, the figure suffered from using die cast parts like previous Alien release and uh, inconsistent engineering to be clear, um, well, there was a clear dome which warped light and actually it made it seem like the sculpt underneath wasn't all that great. The sculpt, it, it was great, but it, it, it wasn't a, a good release. It, it just wasn't. And um, I gave it a great review. June, back here again. The Larvae set. Not a whole lot to say here. P Bandai exclusive, 10,000 Japanese yen. Accessories are a silk spray for the Mothra larva, along with a little tiny baby support stand. And they really emphasize the stretchability for Mothra. Neato. The figures were relatively well received. Then July came around, and oh boy, the beginning of the end. Sort of? Godzilla. 6,800 Japanese yen. That's it, that's the official name. In the US, it was marketed as birth version, and at some events we'll see soon, it was marketed as the Versus series. It came with a red version of the original beam effect. Cool, but it was just a repaint. No, no, the figure, it was a repaint. It was the first of many to come, and it served as an unofficial Heisei 2.0 Godzilla, and this was intended to be an adult Godzilla Jr., but this would be the moment where it would be a deciding factor for the line. Would repaints sell in this market? If they would, and this figure would sell, we would get more. If not, this would be the last. This would end up selling like hotcakes and would be one of the very few figures in this line to be reissued. It would be reissued again in August of 2015. August 2014, Heavy Arms Wolf, 6,000 yen. That's it, Wolf with different paint and different accessories and done with Alien and Predator, rest in peace for now. Who knows what might come later? September of 2014, no. We're hitting the reset button just real quick. We gotta talk about something. 2014 was the 60th anniversary of Godzilla, the original film, a part of the genesis of Toku. Anything kaiju related would come from that movie, and undoubtedly there are others, but so much came from the original movie in 1954. So Tamashi Nation's a company that really prided itself so much so on doing anniversary releases and timing things up correctly. How do they celebrate it? Well, Toy Fair 2014 saw this teaser. 
Confirmed, we were getting Godzilla 2014. Fantastic. Relative radio silence until this popped up at the Akiba showroom. Ooh, mama, we're getting close. At this time, NECA officially entered into the Godzilla game, and they actually already released their Godzilla 2014, and they utilized CGI files from the movie. And, um, other Godzilla figures. So the pressure was on. Something that was $20 on the market, and Bandai had to step up to the plate and knock it out of the park. We heard next to nothing the first half of 2014. Then the week of release. Lufen began teases, pixelated images, black and white, all of these right before the big reveal. Yeah, that's not accurate. Plates, chest, feet, head to be released in September for 6,800 yen? He was sculpted by Yuji Sakai apparently with outdated reference materials, but still. While we're waiting for his release throughout the summer, we will see him get his own dedicated display at SDCC. We'll see advertisements in hobby magazines in Japan, and we'll even see the Akiba showroom get a display prototype of 2014. Now going back real quick to the prototype for Godzilla 2014, he was on display at the Akiba showroom and they had displays for each of the movies they were able to complete, such as Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah, Godzilla vs. Mothra, and Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla. In the Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla display, they happened to display a brown Rodan. This is going to be around the July 4th holiday in the United States. This is going to be the only time that this brown Rodan is seen. Interestingly enough, the placard that's shown with it is for Fire Rodan. A nice display of the past and future before the final release. That's it. That's the figure. Red nose for no reason, sloppy teeth, pain, and bad eyes. There were some... <clears throat> prominent members of the fandom who said it wasn't an issue. However, this was consistent across the board. Loose joints as well. No reissue, no acknowledgement of this. And this was the 60th anniversary of stated by Bandai. And it was a colossal quality control nightmare and pretty much forgotten. Sort of October, 2014 was neat. We had two accessory sets effect set two for 2,700 and weapons two for 3,000 yen, both with buildings, though one had generic Godzilla effects and the other had JSF tanks and aircrafts. Both would be P Bandai releases. And speaking of P Bandai releases, we also had the heavily armed high mobility type Kiryu for 12,000 Japanese yen. This is the version from Tokyo SOS. And as a matter of fact, I remember seeing this being revealed in the magazine scan as I was leaving my second viewing of Godzilla 2014. New sculpt indeed, it was a chance for people who missed out on the original to get a version of Kiyu again. See, at this time, prices were starting to spike on older, out of production figures, and there were people, no names, but maybe some with insider info who maybe shouldn't have it, watching carefully who were scalping figures. Call and response, remember repaints from earlier? We're gonna see more of those next year. One last point for 2014, Tamashi Nation 2014, a beam repaint for Godzilla 2014, and an all red 2014? Uh, we'll see soon enough. And those first few intro notes should tell you everything you need to know about 2015. I'm sorry to say this, but this year begins to dip for some and the sustainment for others. <sighs> yes, yes. Last year, we got the taste of repaints with birth version. And this year, five of seven releases are repaints. 71%. For those who have been collecting the line so far, a pretty sleeper year where your wallet basically could rest. But if you missed out on some releases, this would be a good year to pick up repaints. Some good, other sloppy. 
But let's talk about the new stuff to kick off the year. January brought us Gamera 1996 for 8800 Japanese yen, and he was packed with accessories. Godzilla, Kong, Gamera, all the giant kaiju are here pretty much, and it's a great sight to see. Greatly received, the only issue that this one had was that the plastron was a little fiddly due to the big mana cannon blaster, but even then, it's all fine. That following month for 18,000. Japanese Yen as a P Bandai exclusive, we finally had Mecha King Ghidorah. No beams, but he does have the G grasping cables and the Dorats. Dorats? Dorats? Whatever. A very good and highly sought after release to this day. Now, what's actually pretty funny with this release is that Amazon uh, unfortunately had bottomed out the price for this one to about 30 or so dollars. Um, so there were a lot of folks who had a, had a field day with this one. Of note, there was a popular myth that the entire figure was sculpted from the ground up and was completely new. However, Bandai itself released neat promotional pictures showing what was reused in yellow and what was new in gray. That same month, Godzilla 2014 was released on home video in Japan, and to commemorate this, Bandai did a poster color version of Godzilla 2014, a Dorito Dust version. 15,000 yen for the whole kit and caboodle, and it was exclusive to Amazon Japan, but it shipped to US addresses, probably other territories as well. So everyone had a shot at it, and it was sloppy. Some, even uh, from the prototype pictures released, believe that these were actually repainted original 2014s that were repacked that didn't sell, but we'll never really know. And the start of the repaints this year begins. May comes around the corner with a P Bandai release. Pretty much everything up until the end of this year is going to be a P Bandai, so I won't mention that from here on out. We do have a release of Godzilla 2000 Millennium Special Color Version. Special Color Version is the name of the game here for repaints in the line. 7200 yen, gray dorsal plates, no effects, very simple. It's actually reminiscent of one of the Godzillas in the concept artwork for Final Wars. July. Spitfire Godzilla 2014, 7500 JPY, and this would be the first beam variant of a figure. He comes with a snazzy use of translucent plastic, severed Muto head, with a hand part to hold the head, and a beam effect with a stand. Now that sand it just it said, said Godzilla on it, it's pretty cool. The eyes generally had better paint than the OG release and placement than the OG release, but it still wasn't perfect. October would see Godzilla 1964 Emergence of Godzilla version, sporting a scene-specific dusty paint job with a beam effect for 6,800 yen. Boy, another Showa release and a repaint, but another Showa. Beam's cool, and I guess that's what's most important, because that won some folks over. Now we're about to round out the year, let's talk about events. Summer One Fest was a bit of a nothing from Yuji Sakai, but Winter brought about a neat display showing some of the releases. Cool. SDCC had an early US availability for the Spitfire Godzilla 2014. NYCC had a neat display with some figures, along with this big guy. December, 13,800 yen, P Bandai, like usual. Special color version, King Ghidorah. Now, the wings. The figure is the same as the original, except for a new paint scheme to be closer to what we saw on the poster for Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah, and new accessories. Beams, kid spaceship, support stand, finally. Oh, well, anyway, the sculpt is going to be the same. However, it seems like less breakages were reported with the wings, and this may be due to consumers being aware of the issue and maybe different materials being used for the joints. The world may never know. At the end of the day, we had less breakages. Overall, this was a pretty solid release. Did this year seem underwhelming to you? Well, get used to it. It's unfortunately not going to get too much better anytime soon. And next year is 2016. Twenty fourteen was the first year the SH Monster Arts line was going, and there was a movie that was released. And usually, when Bandai is able to tie in with relevant media, we get a ton of product to go with it. Look at Common Rider, 
or Dragon Ball, specifically with the recent Broly movie from the Super tie-in. Unfortunately, we would only get Godzilla from the 2014 movie, but what about 2016? Round 2, 2016 saw the first Japanese Godzilla movie from Anno of Evangelion fame, Shin Godzilla. Many were hyped, some were just angry, no discernible reason about this release. Yeah, cool, but one thing was clear, we were getting product. The movie wouldn't release until the summer, but Bandai had something right up their sleeve, right? Mostly dead silence. We didn't hear much about anything for some time, and 2016 would be the year of Godzilla, for better or worse. The first release we would see would be about halfway through the year in June, Godzilla 2001, P. Bandai, 8200 Japanese yen. Just the figure, no accessories, and some had QC issues with hands falling off and uh, touchy paint here or there. Otherwise, a fan favorite in the lineup. Some folks really did like this one. During this time, we had another figure revealed and released. Godzilla 1954. Yep, now they get to it. Following in July, which was a general release for 7,800 yen. This figure would actually get reissued in about July 2020. Rather mixed reactions here. Some found the sculpt to be a bit off, though it appears closely to the larger sculpts that Yuji Sakai has made, just shrunken down. One of the biggest critiques would be the eyes. The design of 1954 is known to have eyes that look down into the side, but some figures had one eye looking forward, the other looking down, eyes looking down for both of them, but one looking more so forward and the other back. Get ready for that point later. In June as well, there would be a book released which delved into the SH Monster Arts line a little bit for roughly $45 or so. I say a little bit considering that's what the book was for. Notice anything on the cover here? We'll talk about that new Godzilla in depth in just a minute. Because of copyright, I'm a bit iffy to go all in depth from all the scans that are available online, but here, this is what Hobby Search has for their product listing, so I'm a little comfortable sharing that. But the book goes into the releases all up to this point in the line, namely just Godzilla to my understanding, and it did reveal Ultimate Burning Version. Mm hmm yep, we'll talk about that in a little bit. In October, for 18,500 yen, we get the first SH Monster Arts Ko Kyo Kyok, Godzilla, 1989. Kokyo Kyok, Lights, Sound, Music. Upon release, divided. This was a general release. Some love it to this day, others find it lukewarm. And the button doesn't work anymore. Regardless, it would be the only release in this subline to date, and it's not an SH Monster Arts proper. Next year, we would get a teaser of another, but that's it. On a side note, import sites sold out near instantly, except AmiAmi, who had server maintenance <laughs> right before this went up for pre-order. And then once maintenance ended, it sold out. But then they did take orders a day later and there were no issues. By the way, the maintenance started at around 1 a.m. and it didn't end until around 6 a.m. My time, so that was a fun night. Oh, you want to hear about events? Well, let's go ahead and talk about it right now. May brought us Tamashi Features. And it brought us this. We'll see it next year, so let's talk about it then. In July, we had SDCC. Here we're gonna talk about SH Figure Arts for just one second because it's really cool. We get the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. It'd be a P Bandai release for next year and not in the SH Monster Arts line, unfortunately not distributed in the US, but very cool. Anyway, SDCC showed us, which was revealed in that book as well, Godzilla Ultimate Burning Version, as well as yet to be released GMK and 1954 Gojis. We did see the Kokyo Kyo G89 present as well. Tamashi Nation 2016 in October brought us our first look at the Chogokin Orai Noriyoshi poster version Mecha Godzilla. Whew, that's a mouthful. And the second and third forms of Shin Godzilla. And we'll see these released next year. So mm, let's move on. Here we go. Oh, November 2016, which was reissued in January 2018 for 12,000 yen, Godzilla 2016. A new Godzilla design out of Japan in the figure just, it, it just doesn't nail it. What's, what's a good thing here is that, oh boy, Shin was actually a team effort. Yes, so 
Takayuki Takeya is actually going to be sort of the spearhead for this project. However, uh, Genzo Ihara, Masaki Ozeki, and Atsushi Hagiwara, which I'm probably not pronouncing their names correctly, pardon my ignorance, they were all a part of making the prototypes, according to Tamashi's website. Now, with that, um, they all worked on the prototype, and I don't want to say that they did a bad job, because the actual prototype for this figure doesn't really look all that bad. The paint applications are rather good, and uh, the, 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 it's pretty intimidating, and we get some rather nice paint applications. However, in the actual execution, it, it, just, it just falls apart here, and it's very unfortunate. Paint scratches very easily, loose joints, the eyes once again are not properly aligned. And then on that note of loose joints, sometimes they were so tight that the arms broke. Oddly enough, it wasn't well received, but at the same time, considering what it is, this thing sold like hotcakes, so yeah, a lot of people did buy it. Now, speaking of that. 2016, the original came out a couple years ago, so here we are in December with a P Bandai release, Godzilla Ultimate Burning version for 8800 Japanese yen. It came with smoke effects, and they were a bit awkward to attach on. This one had completely orange dorsal plates, remember, perspective accuracy from earlier. Quality on this one could be a bit hit or miss. Some had really loose joints, others had really tight joints, and the eyes. Mine was not the only one with this incident, which sucks. 2016 is really short because there really isn't much going on here, so let's close the book and move on. Funny how Shin Godzilla has undoubtedly become one of the most iconic Godzilla films objectively, like it or not, but the year for this line wasn't so hot, huh? Twenty sixteen was a whole lot of nothing despite Shin Godzilla happening and being one of the most dominant movies in the franchise. But that's what this year was for. We're gonna get a ton of Shin repaints in a second attempt at a US premium Bandai site. Huh? We didn't even talk about the first one. Well, we'll talk about that in a bit. And another distribution kerfuffle. And now for something completely different. January, a P Bandai exclusive Godzilla featuring Ava 01. Yeah. So Hideaki Anno did work on Shin Godzilla, as you all probably know at this point, and Anno is strong with this one. 9,200 Japanese yen, and this was also apparently able to be ordered through some Evangelion store as well. I never saw a listing for that myself. At any rate, the box was stellar, and he came with a purple beam, and the same alternate hand parts that the other 95 molds came with. Do you like repaints? Mm-hmm. How about one that made sense? March 10,000 yen, another P Bandai, saw Super Mecha Godzilla. This release saw a retooling of the original Heisei Mecha Godzilla so he could look up without swappable parts. Accessories were limited, except for this one comes with the Garuda. Remember the second accessory set from the line start way back at the beginning? Now we're getting the Garuda and a support stand. Yay! 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 Very minimal release here without the shock anchors or beam effects, but hey, we get a seemingly good repaint for up on the shelf. Except for I had to go with three and kit bash them together to get an acceptable one. Now, what if I told you we had back-to-back -back releases in March? So, we have one P Bandai release, let's go for two. Destroy a special color version, 14,000 yen. And he comes with a total of eight tanks for display and a more so accurate paint application for the head. Yeah, this one has yellow eyes while the original had red. Mm-hmm. Wallets were hurting at this time for those who needed or wanted these. So we have three repaints to kick off the year. Yeah, not for everyone, especially with December of the previous year having a repaint as well. So how do we get all fans excited? Uh, another P Bandai release, Shin Godzilla Forms 2 and 3 in a set in May as a web exclusive. Mm -hmm. Yep, 8,500 yen. So these two would release to lackluster response with some quality control concerns. Some already had breakages right out of the box. Stuck paints. Yeah. 
Yeah. But it was more Shin. And by golly, yeehaw. Yeehaw. July for 14,800 Japanese yen. Can you guess what it is? Godzilla 2016 Fourth Form Awakening version. All right, now buckle in for this one, folks. This one features a purple paint scheme, lasers, a napalm or smoke effect, whatever you'd prefer to call it, alternate tail and head pieces, and dedicated support stands. Which, by the way, the little tip for the lasers are exclusive to this release. Don't lose them. Now, Orders for this release open on January 27th and close on February 9th. Yes, they hit order limit that quick. Wait a minute, let me back it up here. Premium Bandai Web Exclusive, they're used interchangeably. Essentially, Web Exclusive is catch-all for terms where companies like Good Smile, X Plus, even NECA, Web Exclusive just means exclusive to a web store. So P Bandai is Web Exclusive. Now, when it comes to P Bandai Web Exclusives, usually they announce that they're going to take orders for a set period of time, right? Now you order the figure and then it gets shipped to you. And the intent here for P Bandai in specific is they're not meant to be reissued. One production run and done. However, every so often in extreme circumstances like licensing availability in new regions, they may do reissues unless another scenario pops up like here. So we have orders cap for Shin. Mm, what happens? Because this is the first time they do a second order window. Now they're going to do an order window that will ship in August. Orders started February 10th and ended March 29th, still sooner than the average release. So what did they do? A third order window for lottery sales that went from April 7th until May 22nd, where you enter for a chance to buy this and that order window shipped in September. Three, count them, three order windows for Purple Drank Shin. Oh, whew. yeah, the Japanese web shop was hopping. Well, the US one was kind of just sort of getting started. At the time of recording, Bandai has gotten the kinks worked out of the USP Bandai website. Shipping is seemingly a flat rate of 10 bucks for all orders. Not all P Bandai releases are on the US site. Most are still carried by Bluefin, but in 2017, Bandai tried their second attempt at a US site. They did try one before, but I think it had all of three things on it and it's lost to the ether of the internet. And I can't find the page. You can't even really pull it on way back. So, yeah. However, I can provide you with these archive screenshots courtesy of the Wayback Machine of their second attempt. There's a release we'll talk about soon that would be the last for the SH Monster Arts at this version of the P-Bandai website. And again, we'll get there soon. Now at this time, they had a flat rate of $33 for FedEx shipping and all orders shipped out of Hong Kong. Mothra Special Color Version, Imago and Larva in one set for 10,000 yen. August release, P Bandai release, comes with antennae beams for Mothra, and this one had quality control issues which unfortunately thick paint causing broken joints. This would be the first figure in the line offered through the US P Bandai website. Orai Noriyoshi was a prolific artist, especially for movie poster work. He did work on several posters for oddball movies and, uh, uh, some movies called Star Wars, another notable movie called Mad Max, specifically the sequel, and then Godzilla. There was a design for Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 in the Heisei era, and we got another repaint of Godzilla 1995 in colors intended to replicate the poster. So, to be clear, we got the Orai Noriyoshi Mechagodzilla poster version in the Chogokin line, and then we went ahead and got the repaint of Godzilla 1995. So, Godzilla 95 here, the repaint, released in September for 8,000 yen. Mm -hmm. So this one came with a little poster card. Cool. Now, let's talk about Mechagodzilla. Proper name, Chogokin Tamashi Mix Mechagodzilla Orai Noriyoshi poster version. 17,280 Japanese yen, September. Companion piece to Godzilla, again, both P Bandai exclusives. Brought to retail in the US by Bluefin not on the USP Bandai site. The Mechagodzilla is a combiner of sorts, and it has working wheels, different transformation options, lots of stuff, even a comic about the figure. Unfortunately, there were some issues with fragility, but the die-cast beastie, it did turn out rather nice, and now still commands a nice price 
on the aftermarket. Shin Godzilla is already out on home media at this point, but during its release period, Toho did a limited mail campaign where if you bought a specific copy of the movie, you could fill out a form to get Shin Godzilla second and third form set or fourth form or both in exclusive maquette colors officially called the Godzilla Store Limited Color Version. The two form set cost 8,500, while the fourth form was 12,000 yen. October release, and to be frank, the paint scheme really does bring out the finer details of the sculpt. As an editor note, these are my favorite Shin Godzilla releases in the line to date. You may have noted that I um, haven't really talked about Toy Fair or SDCC, NYCC, a Tamashi Features, or anything like that up to this point. Well, this year was pretty silent aside from showing some of the prototypes we already knew about or stuff that was previously released, except Tamashi Nation 2017. Kokyo Kyok, Godzilla 2016. This was shown. At the time of publication, which is going to be November of 2021, nothing on this release. Or is canceled, shelved, waiting on an anniversary? We'll never really know. 14,000 yen in October would have also gotten you the Imago and Larva special color version of Batra set. The Larva comes with a horn beam, and as an editor note, the special color version Mothra was where I kind of just tapped out of the special color versions for whatever it may be worth. And it doesn't help that Godzilla Jr. special color version is out the following month in November for 5,200 yen, which he comes with a beam. Cool. Now, this would be the last release for the USP Bandai site. And actually, shortly after this, the web shop would go completely dormant and then relaunch later. Why? On something like Batra, rounding and accounting for fees and so forth, it's about 150 bucks. The shipping bumps it up to 180 or so. And to be honest, at that point, yes, it's more expensive, but that's international shipping on a big box. Okay, Junior, 52 or so dollars for the figure and $33 for shipping. Mm -hmm. $85 for Junior. You could import this for $70 or so at the time of release, no questions asked, and get it a few days after release. And that's not factoring in bundling him with other items you may get from Japan. You see what I'm saying here? It's not very practical and it ends up with the US being in the red. So, yeah. I'll count Awakening Shin Godzilla as a new sculpt due to the uniqueness of the Awakening moment and the head sculpt parts, which actually, they did make new head sculpt parts for this version of Godzilla 2016. And we'll consider the Chogokin Mecha Godzilla an honorary SH Monster Arts. At this point, of the 12 releases, of which technically two were repaints of figures released that year, the Godzilla Store Shins, 25% of the releases were new sculpts that were released in this year. You see what I'm talking about? We'll talk repaints in the next section, but this is a continuing trend that made folks a bit upset. Especially with this. December, 9200 yen, Godzilla 2017. A general release with a limited card, which great artwork, not gonna lie. This one had a rocky release, and honestly, quite frankly, what could be argued as an obsolete figure in the line. Let me explain. First, this was supposed to be released in the US by Bluefin. However, there was an issue with licensing being approved and orders were canceled. This figure was not approved for distribution in the US market. Why? Don't know. Furthermore, keep in mind, this is Godzilla Earth, apparently before the time skip. Other Godzilla 2017 figures have a more striking paint scheme and they're meant to do the same thing. Upon initial release, there were some collectors who really felt this release looked great with rather blobby paint in some areas, loose joints and quality control. To be honest, didn't call it what it is. It's a lazy release and you're gonna see why next year. Why is it obsolete? Man, I didn't put effort into it and you're gonna see why next year. Oh, and oh boy, is next year better than ever because we're gonna get a proper Godzilla Earth and it's really good. You're gonna see why in just a little bit. Twenty eighteen actually though was for all intents and purposes uneventful. Mostly? Maybe? Kinda depends on you. But we're gonna start things off with Showa. 
solicited the previous year, Mechagodzilla 1974 released in January, P Bandai release, 9,000 yen, and to say responses were mixed would be putting it lightly. Some just love Mechagodzilla, so it doesn't matter, it's gonna get bought up, but for this one, he was small, and the crinkly parts of the design, like on the shoulders, they used metal rings which sometimes fell into the figure and were difficult to pull out and reset. Rather lukewarm response, however, that aftermarket price, though. February brought up a rarity, an SH Monster Arts release, which was in demand in the United States, but it wasn't brought over. The SH Monster Arts Space Godzilla and Little Godzilla Special Color version set, P Bandai release, for 13,800 yen. When this figure was up for pre-order, the second iteration of the USP Bandai site was done, and Bluefin didn't distribute this. With that gap, there was no US release, so there were a lot of collectors in the US who didn't know how to work middleman sites, so they never got it. This set is seen as one of the rarer sets, and quite frankly, one of the rarest sets in the line. In April, unfortunately, we do have to revisit the eye placement quality control issue with the SH Monster Arts Godzilla 2002. This is going to be a general release, which would later get reissued a couple of years later with 1954, and the price is 8,500 yen. Seven years into the line, and the final product is still dealing with eye placement issues. Well, sometimes, not all of them. So if you gambled, you sometimes got a winner. And what if I told you we ended the year that way as well? Well, don't worry, because in July, as a web exclusive, distribution rights were worked out for Shin Godzilla. And for 13,000 yen, Godzilla 2016 fourth form Frozen version, it was released in the United States. Now, do take note, this was also a P Bandai release. That's it, that's the release. Now, this one was criticized for mostly not being an X. And no, to be clear, I'm not saying because it's not a statue. Lots of specific language was thrown around because this wasn't an X+. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Had a rather cold <laughs> reception, and Bluefin itself actually had a lot of clearance sales with this one. They even had to throw in Tamashi effect items just to get this one out the door. Once again, I haven't really talked about events, and if you notice this trend for about the last five years or so, yeah. Well, let's go ahead and take a small break. Toy Fair 2018 saw Pacific Rim. Here's the Solar Chogokin Crimson Typhoon. Bet you didn't see this one, or forgot about it. Then San Diego Comic Con. Then New York Comic Con. That's it. That's what we got until the end of the year. And I have to do a dramatic part for this chapter. Now, why am I pointing out Pacific Rim? Well, if we go back a few years ago, I mean, obviously we're talking about Uprising. Mostly, that's the majority of the product. But what did Tomashi Nations and Bluefin have to say about Pacific Rim. Pacific Rim! Mm, yeah, everybody's asking that one because, I mean, kaiju and giant robots, that's our area of specialty. And uh, we that was on a survey for San Diego Comic-Con. We know the feedback. We know everybody wants to see it. Um, they want the articulation done right. They want people making, yeah. <laughs> they want people making Japanese giant robots who know how to make the Japanese, Japanese giant robots. robots. So it's natural we would get that inquiry. And it, to be honest, it's really something that we wanted to do from the beginning, and, and it just comes down to licensing. And when we, I think it's more of a question of when, it's also if from licensing, but it's certainly we want something we want to do. Del Toro does have a sense of design for monsters and, and now robots too. So, um, and he has a, a profound respect for the genre of giant robots, kaiju. Um, so hopefully one day it's something that we will, will come to fruition under multiple categories, you know, with diecast, non-diecast, monster even, arts. Even gimmick, gimmick toys, myself and, uh, and Josh Perez, a colorist on IDW, we were kind of just lamenting that this movie is out there, like we would happily even buy like rocket punching plasma fist gypsy dangers. Oh, yeah. so. yeah. A super robot Chogokin, you know, gypsy danger would be super be cool. cool. Yeah, super cool. awesome. Yeah. If we could do it. That'd be, be cool. That'd hypothetically, be cool. that'd be cool. Yeah, that'd be cool. Hypothet hypothetically, <laughs> hypothetically that, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> yeah, that does. Yeah, you know. Pacific Rim, that'd, that'd be pretty cool. cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pretty cool. Well, I'll add it to the whiteboard and consideration. So you saw the end of the year pretty much. <clears throat> August for 12,000 yen. As a P Bandai release brought to the US, fans had a third chance at Kiyu. MFS 3, Type 3, Machine Dragon, Shinagawa Final Battle version. 
absolute zero cannon battle damage parts, basically an updated original Kiyu release to go with Godzilla 2002. Neat. Next, October was an Eiffel Tower. What's that? You'll learn when you're older. If you know, you'll know they're great. Or awkward. October saw the mm, not so accurate Gamera 1999 for 10,000 yen. And with that, he came with flying parts and a manifest. Nice. Teeth were terrible, not fun. October also saw for just 1,000 yen more Godzilla Earth, P. Bandai release. A repaint and slight resculpt of 2017, we have no pain issues, no joint issues, nothing popped off, much so improved over 2017, and furthermore, we got small Godzilla Phileas. Editor's note, I made a whole bunch of folks mad in my review where I cheekily referred to uh, this one as Minia, but say la vie. And we got a little battleship. This, uh, much like Shin, uh, the anime licensing trilogy was fixed, and the, the repaint got released in the US, which is great, which is great. Now finally for this year releases, we did have another P Bandai release, Godzilla 1962 for 9200 yen. The US wouldn't see this guy in distribution until January the following year. Unfortunately, still a bit small, they can't figure out the scaling for the Showa era. Now this figure did suffer some issue with pupil placement and had questionable claw paint, actually almost none at all. However, we did get a beam effect, neat. That was 2018, City on Edge of Battle premiered, less than stellar response, however, at Tokyo Comic Con, well actually, we saw our first look, not at monster art specifically, but the next MonsterVerse Kaiju, Godzilla, Mothra, Rodan, and King Ghidorah. Two kings would go up for pre-order the following month. Moving forward, we're more so in the now era, if you will, of the SH Monster Arts line. A good amount of people pretty much know what's going on in the line from here on out, and this section and the next upcoming sections will mostly just be a recap. However, as a trip down memory lane, you know we gotta do it. January 2019 saw pre-orders kick off for Godzilla and King Ghidorah 2019, and Bandai touted their prototypes for all of the King of the Monster figures throughout the conventions throughout the year and at different promotional events. Now something of note, we did see this prototype for King Ghidorah. Keep this one in mind when we recap everything at the end. Now, Tamashi Nations even had an interview with Mr. Mike Doherty up on the official website to promote the line of figures. Cool. Now, the figures were based off of the CGI models with Sakai and Wakasa doing color corrections for paint and apparently minor sculpt changes to accommodate engineering so this way they were able to keep the integrity of the designs. While the sculpts and the paint scheme do not match what we saw on the screen at the end of the day, this can be attributed to last minute changes in the models such as King Ghidorah getting slimmer and realistically speaking considering again you have to figure that there's a lead time for getting sculpts done and getting it over to the factories in China or Vietnam. It really isn't all entirely on Bandai here. Godzilla 2019 is the first figure released that year as a general for 6,500 yen in May, just in time for the movie's release. The prototype and the promo pictures look phenomenal, and he comes with a beam and jaw part to recreate the scenes in the movie where he's firing it straight up in the air. Whack. Unfortunately, the eyes and the teeth are uh, also whack. Still issues that are present here with this release and your mileage may vary whether or not they're gonna be okay or not very good. Now on that note, King Ghidorah, June, 17,000 yen as general release and this one is tricky. So it came with support stands, which is fine, but the wings were a point of contention with only minimal articulation in the attachment point at the base. Likewise, they're huge and made of hard plastic, which did result in some instances of breakage especially with the spikes. The softer material for the necks and the tails caused parts to pop off, and it was darker than the prototype that they showed, not the first one that was metallic, and some for the final product, the different paint apps on the wings, making them look different, and many fresh out of the box literally had paint damage on them, including mine. While not a favorable release, this is the biggest six inch scale, six inch scale. King Ghidorah 2019 figure that we have, so there's not much else we could ask for. Price shot up near immediately on the aftermarket, and the following year, we'd see how large wings could be done. 
Like I mentioned, the conventions this year pretty much were just focused on King of the Monsters, since, well, that's pretty much all we got. Except Gamera 1995 in August for 10,000 yen. As a P Bandai release, not distributed by Bluefin. Mm hmm. Yep, the only Gamera figure not to be officially released in the US. And oddly enough, yeah, it's not a Monster Arts figure in the US. It's, it's not officially in the US. Very peculiar. This is saddening because one, the US didn't get it at retail like the other web exclusives, obviously. And. We have all three Heisei Gameras, but nothing else. More to come? Who knows? The summer was odd for another reason. If there were bootleg SH Monster Arts figures before, they were all well done or hidden away. I really can't find documentation of them. This marks the first time there were bootlegs of SH Monster Arts figures. Godzilla 2019 got one which... Terrible. And later in the year, Rodan and Mothra would get them. And unless you had them in hand, it's actually kind of scary. You may not be able to tell the quality control difference. And King Ghidorah 2019 got one, or at least as advertised. Legend Creation is a bootlegging company that somehow gets access to molds from Tamashii Nations. Pretty much the same time as Godzilla's came out, listings for one for King Ghidorah came out as well. With these promo pictures a Showa King Ghidorah. We don't know where or what the origin of this is. There's a Yuji Sakai model kit, and this isn't it, it's debunked. What was interesting is the following. Bootleggers got a hold of some King Ghidorah mold quick, on the fly, to get it out on time for the movie, and even if it was the wrong one, it's painted in King Ghidorah 2019's colors. Wrong all around, it's sloppy, like the people doing this just grabbed whatever Ghidorah they could and give it the technically correct paint apps. SH Monster Arts to be something else we may never know. Now of this note, Heisei Ghidorah also got bootlegged with mix and match parts from the Showa release that we have here, and Heisei parts as well. In October, we had Tamashii Nation 2019, which saw the reveal of Burning Godzilla 2019, which had a blue tint to it. This would later be accredited to the lights in the display, and that's really it for new reveals. November for 10,000 yen saw a P Bandai release of Rodan and Mothra as a set, which had no accessories other than stands. Inaccurate due to no molten effects on Rodan as seen on him throughout the movie, and Mothra's missing blue on the wings. But still, some love for Rodan and meh towards Mothra, take it or leave it. The next release was a big take it though. December saw the home media release of King of the Monsters in Japan. And with it, like Godzilla 2014, before it came Godzilla 2019 poster color version bundled with a special home version release. While it was available at some retailers in Japan, it was available at Amazon Japan. And like the 2014 movie, this shipped internationally, including to those in the United States, and everyone in the US had access to this at MSRP, just like the last one. Some, for whatever reason, didn't know that or opted to wait for the aftermarket, though to be kind of fair, this sold out in roughly 48 hours on Amazon Japan. Now, of course, orders would pop back up and then down all the way up until release, but suffice to say, this was a hot seller. And way after release, this commands still a pretty penny, going for 35,000 yen or more just for the figure on secondhand sites. Official MSRP, at least through Amazon Japan, would be 16,300 yen. 2020 comes next. The biggest showdown that year wouldn't be Godzilla vs. Kong. It'd be something so small it knocked the world for a loop. But at least we got Monster Hunter. Twenty twenty was a year. <laughs> To put it lightly, COVID-19 basically threw everything for a loop, and unfortunately, plans for many things went askew. The big movie for the line, Godzilla vs. Kong, got delayed. 
a lot, many times, to and from 2020, 2021, and though Playmates figures, well, they got released with pretty much no issues except for things to avoid spoilers, Bandai obviously had a bit more on the line here, so we didn't really see anything regarding figures for the movie this year. However, in March, we got ourselves a teaser for what was a match made in heaven, and finally, they got around to doing. June brought us a web exclusive of Burning Godzilla 2019 for 8500 JPY. Not an overall exciting release as it came with no accessories, but this just about wrapped up the King of the Monsters releases, aside from B-list kaiju in the movie. The following month, July, saw Tamashii Nation 2020, which we'll touch on in just a bit. But the month also saw two reissues. Initially, folks really just thought this was for the US market. However, not exactly true. Now, these two reissues, basically, we never really see reissues in this line, so it's pretty important. We saw a reissue of Godzilla 2002 and 1954. 2002 utilized now commonplace eye printing technology, which some of Bandai's humanoid figures, like let's say the Avengers figure arts, they used. And really, the quality from the first one, even with this printing technology, it didn't really go up that well. So if you can find them, I guess it's just going to be a matter of your own preference. In August, we would get the second SH Monster Arts event exclusive figure in the line. The event exclusive color edition Godzilla 2019 in an all cool blue color. Now this one came with a beam and it came with a nice card. Hmm, I wonder if it was made by anyone important. Available in other territories as well, it was available during the SDCC stay at home event with orders placed through Premium Bandai. Later on, it would be available through Bluefin Distribution. However, at initial launch, it was through Premium Bandai in the United States. Oh. Oh dear. Yeah, this was the third attempt at a US web shop, which was referenced back a few years ago. And this time, this launch, the website kept crashing during the initial order period when the figure went up. And let's be honest here, it did go up with some other event exclusive color editions, namely Dragon Ball figure arts. And in Japan, some of the practice is to just ship out P Bandai items in just the brown box. Well, they tried that here in the US, no box for single ordered items, meaning if you just ordered this Godzilla, that's how it shipped, and yeah, it didn't go well. If you ordered more than one item, however, you got a box, but really no padding on the inside. I will say, as someone who has purchased from Premium Bandai since then, at the time of recording, we're going on well over a year since this has shipped out. I will say they've pretty much corrected this issue entirely, but still, for what is effectively the launch of the USP Bandai for most collectors, for a third time, this is a little upsetting. Since COVID hit, events were at home or were just outright canceled. Like I just got done saying, SDCC was at home this year and the event exclusive Godzilla 2019 was intended for SDCC, NYCC, and other events around the world. Event exclusive color edition, not locked to one in specific. Tamashi Nation 2020 was virtual too. We did see some goodies there, but just for hype purposes, I'll circle back in about a minute. In September, we saw the first Monster Hunter release in the line, Nargakuga for 7500 JPY. A general release, Narg launches with a support stand with a wooden log base, flared out tail, extra wing parts, and head to simulate when he's enraged. The first production run bonus includes a mini Rathalos Hunter, though there's something to note here. Formally, Best to my knowledge, I've scoured around anywhere, there has not been an announcement of Nargakuga getting reissued. However, I have seen boxes without the label showing the Mini Hunter is included, which is indicative of a reissue. I just gotta share this to you. Buyer beware. Sticker could have fallen off. Who knows? Rathalos was the following month, October for 12,000 Japanese yen and a general release. The original flagship of the series, he came with a small flame effect and a flight support stand and also a walking support stand. Rathalos has two small chicken legs. Speaking of those legs, there were uh, yeah, there was an issue with the ankle joint engineering, which some attributed to a manufacturing defect. 
but what actually happened is that there are nubs in the ankle joints which are meant to grip into the sleeve on the ankle sculpt. This was intended, it just did not work well. Bouncing back to Tamashi Nation 2020, we had a virtual event in July where, for some items, Bandai afforded people the option to view items with a 360 spin view. And here, we saw the Godzilla 2001 Radiant Heat Ray version, which would later be released in November as a P Bandai exclusive for 9,000 Japanese yen. And then, at the same time, we also saw the special color version of Biolante, which would be released in December for 28,000 Japanese yen, and like the original, she was a P Bandai release. While Biolante retained the LED feature, Nothing else was included, despite Bandai teasing a sap spray, and the Atomic Breath repaint GMK Godzilla did not include an Atomic Blast piece. At this event, we also saw the third prototype, which would be released the following year, from Monster Hunter, the Thunderwolf Wyvern Zinogre. It got the 360 spin view treatment as well. Also, a nice diorama display with Nargakuga and Rathalos. We did also get a peek of Godzilla 1989, finally, in the SH Monster Arts line, not Kokyo Kyok. It would be released the following year as well. Godzilla vs. Kong was released, and in May, we saw a back-to-back -back simultaneous release of the monkey and the lizard as general releases, 6,000 Japanese yen. Now, these figures had pre-orders drop in the middle of the night in the United States, when no one knew they were going to drop. So those who were importing were either awake and uh, got lucky, or slept right through it, and when they woke up, then, you know, they had to wait for U.S. distribution, which is just fine and dandy, but they had to get lucky on import sites if that's the route they wanted to go. Kong was sculpted by Shinzen Takuchi, based off of the skeletal structure for Kong in the movie, so not specifically utilizing the digital files from the movie for him, though Godzilla was, once again, like 2019. There were some slight changes from the 2019 design, which ultimately amounted to change in the articulation, though minimally. A concern was that Godzilla's head actually looked a bit different from the prototypes that were on display throughout the course of them showing Godzilla on display and from the promotional pictures, though what specifically happened we may never know for sure. We can see different pictures from the Tamashi Nation's pop-up shop that happened overseas, as well as ones that were held here in the United States in New York. Now as a fun note, Godzilla was made in Vietnam as well. Tamashi Nations did shift over some select figures to be produced there, and this is the first SH Monster Arts figure to be made in Vietnam. Monster Hunter would continue in July with Zenogre, the Thunder Wolf Wyvern. 12,000 Japanese yen and a general release. Based off of his appearance in Iceborne, this would be the last release as of now for Monster Hunter. Godzilla 1989 was delivered in August 2021 after nine years of teasing for 8,500 JPY. No accessories. Feels like Biolante may be doomed, doomed for accessories. No sap, no extra vines, nada. But this Godzilla is in scale with Biolante, which is great. Gigan Decisive Battle version, a web exclusive for 13,800 JPY to be released in September. A repaint of Gigan 2004 with more appropriate accessories, pretty straightforward. Though interestingly, the original Gigan shell formed pretty hard. Oh well, I uh, don't think anyone's going to buy this because we're not getting... Uh, whoa, there's a teaser for Godzilla 2004 with the promotional pictures? Hold up, let's go ahead and hop way back to May of this year. Yes, we did have Godzilla vs. Kong release, but we had Tamashi Features 2021. Right before here, we had updates to Gigan's page. So around this time, we did have Godzilla vs. Kong Monster Arts release, but we had much more going on. Now on Gigan's page, 
his cables originally in the pictures just led off to nothing. Though some retailers initially said Godzilla 2004 was not included. Now, right before pre-orders closed, Bandai began to be a bit coy. While we did not have a confirmed release for 2004 Godzilla, we did get some teaser pictures. These were used in official solicitation. This is basically a confirmation. Here, during Tomashi Features 2021, we also got the official reveal of what would eventually be solicited as a November web exclusive release for 10,000 Japanese yen of Godzilla Ultima. Mm, he's not quite accurate, but he's big, he's huge, extremely long tail, and he comes with two jet jaguars. Small, unpainted, but they're in scale, apparently, thankfully. So Bandai would end up teasing another SH Monster Arts jet jaguar, but we're talking about what gets released in 2021. So we're not talking about him just yet. We also saw what was undoubtedly the most controversial prototype of the year, or possibly even the line, depending on how you look at it. A December web exclusive, the last SH Monster Arts to be released in the first 10 years of this line, Mechagodzilla 2021, 13,500 JPY. No real accessories, but folks were not really pleased with the prototype and how it was displayed. Tamashi Nations tries to be protective of their prototypes, and since people sometimes bump into the displays or they get transported in not the best and safest ways, the resin used could be heavier in some spots, lighter in others, brittle in some areas, and well, unfortunately it can break, and often joints are cosmetic and they don't actually function, and they often sometimes use different types of supports to help keep the figures stand up and glue to hold them in place. And apparently, obviously, these measures were used to make sure the figure was, well, displayed fine enough. But these measures were new to some folks. However, these display techniques are not new. They're just used to make sure that the figure stays in place. If you just look around for some other displays, you'll see that this is a common technique. Now, of note, at the time of publication, a lot of folks don't have Gigan, no one has Godzilla Ultima yet, and Mecha Godzilla, we're not even in the release month. So how did they turn out? Well, I'm sure we'll see soon enough. Some folks have Gigan, but not quite everyone just yet. What does the future hold? How will we be rewarded? Well, we've had teasers for some upcoming releases and we do have some confirmed releases. At the time of upload, we have King Ghidorah 2019 Special Color Version, a P-Bandai release in January of next year for 20,000 yen. And interestingly enough, the official Godzilla Twitter account tweeted out pictures of King Ghidorah, but with, uh, with, with his thumbs, as he, it's affectionately known. We also have Jet Jaguar 2021, also a P-Bandai release in April for 9,000 yen. Like I said before, we have a teaser for Godzilla 2004, and we have a confirmation that a Showa Hidora is in the works, but no concrete release window. Tamashi Nation 2021 is actually going to be right when this uploads, so hey, maybe we'll have more when this goes live. At the end of it, we started with Godzilla and end the decade with Mecha Godzilla. Fitting, isn't it? Well, I suppose month to month it's Godzilla and Godzilla, but regardless, we've had plenty of sculptors, events, interviews, licenses, exclusives. These last 10 years have been filled with the tallest mountains and the lowest valleys. Peaks we never thought might happen and lows that some thought would end the line. Here we are, staring into the next 10 years. So far, for the last 10, we've had Shinichi Wakasa and Yuji Sakai crank out some amazing sculpts. We've had very personal connections about what the business aspect of things look like. We've had successful ventures into exclusive markets and some that really weren't all that successful either. We've had shifting demographics for who's buying what. And quite frankly, the community, well, it's been rather interesting. The best part about all of this is that Godzilla is evergreen. 
Sure, new companies may pick up the license, but every movie is a fan's first. Every figure is a fan's first. And even then, some may be their last. We all have a collection journey. These last 10 years may have had a lot happen in them, but there's one thing about it that was the most important part we didn't really talk about yet that made this whole thing possible. Without it, there would be no community. There would be no demand. There'd be nothing. The SH Monster Arts line is a key property for the United States, and, uh, well, there's only one reason that that happened. The SH Monster Arts line would be nothing without... Scorpio Cesar here and my favorite memory with the SH Monster Arts line was being able to afford my very first one and that was the SH Monster Arts Space Godzilla. My least favorite memory was having to spend $400 for this one and owning this thing. And my least favorite memory with Monster Arts, the release of Shin Godzilla 2016 just kind of showed the line was not going in a good place, but thankfully it did pick back up a, a little bit. And I would say it is in a pretty decent place right now. I'm just happy it was able to climb back up steadily.
Ultrazilla here with my favorite and least favorite SH Monster Arts moments. Favorite being getting this guy, the G89 Deluxe figure. I just felt like this is where the line should be. This left no doubt that it could be a really premium, awesome line. Lights, sounds, and just great overall. And I love the bigger size. Give us more of this, SH Monster Arts. And my least favorite moment was filming the review for this thing. This is horrible. This is a terrible figure. And, um, Tamashi should be ashamed of themselves. And I'm RJ, and that's it. This is, uh, that's the video. There isn't anything else. This isn't a Marvel movie. You can go. Bye. See ya.